If you would stand to honor the reading of God's word, we appreciate it. So Paul says, as we think about starting point, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before, shout before. You welcome it then and you still stand firm in it now. It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. Verse 3, I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures said. Let's end there. Shout amen. 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 Please be seated. God, we thank you for all the ways that you made a way. One of the ways is dying for our sins. Pour your spirit out and work some, you know, just do supernatural work in our thinking and our listening and our hearing today. Let us leave here with a brand new uh, motivation to be in relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So if you drop that, put that passage back up on the screen, the first, first couple of verses uh, there again. And just want to take you through them again one more time. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before you welcomed, before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. Next. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, everybody shout unless, of course you believe something that was never true in the first place. On last week, I told you as we started off this uh, series that uh, we've entitled this starting point because for everything, there is a starting point. For everything, there is a beginning. You had a starting point. Tell the person next to you, you had a starting point. Tell them. You had a beginning. And so it is the case with your faith. Your faith had a starting point, had a beginning. And as life would have it, for many of us, that starting point was in our childhood. Sunday school classes, first communion classes, perhaps around the table as our parents taught us to say uh, blessings over our food or prayers before we went to sleep at night. But for many of us, as we started to grow up, <clears throat> We did not continue to develop the insights of our faith even while our experiences of life kept growing and kept growing. And one day, we looked around and saw that there was a gap. Everybody shout gap. Gap between some of the things that we learned initially and what we are experiencing in the world. And it brought some real questions about faith and about God and what we believe. And as a result of that, uh, many of us acted, you know, we took different paths. For some people, they just became skeptics, which essentially means that uh, they concluded that the Bible and the teachings of Scripture and the church and faith was just not relevant. And so they don't really take it seriously. Skeptics. For others, uh, some people actually walked away from the church, walked away from Scripture, but some of you are here now really kind of seekers. You're not really sure if it's relevant or not, but you hope it is. And you're here listening and paying attention, hoping to hear something about Jesus, something about Scripture that can literally change the trajectory of your life, your seeker. Others of us are believers, but some of us are believers outside of community. We're not a part of any regular church because we've concluded somewhere along our journey we got hurt, somebody said something uh, in a church, something painful took place, we concluded we can't trust organized religion, as, we, as some people say. We can't trust uh, a corporate community. We can't necessarily trust the, trust the church. So I, I believe I follow Jesus but I'm not a part of a community. 
And you kind of miss the point that Jesus invites us to both believe and belong. And then there are some of us who are believers and we're part of a community. We, we regularly attend church. And yet, for even us, there are questions about faith and our relationship that goes unanswered. And in that respect, uh, we should at least know two things. One, for as long as you live, there will always be some questions about your faith and about God that will be unanswered answered because the scripture tells us for now we know in part only when that which is perfect has come will we know as we know in other words faith requires faith just drop that having said that each of us should continue to take steps of learning. Each of us can keep taking steps of growing. We can, we can continue to learn more about God and more about how God wants to re work with us and relate to us. And so uh, I've suggested in this, this series that for those of us who already know a whole lot about the faith, we want to hit the hard reset button. And I don't want you to forget what you know, but I want to kind of help clarify what's the most important stuff. And for some of us who fall in those other categories, seekers or skeptical or whatever the case might be, I want to encourage you to open your mind because you just might hear something, discover something that will just totally change your trajectory as it relates to Jesus' and faith. Matter of fact, I've called this message this morning a shocking discovery. Tell the neighbor next to you, a shocking discovery. To tell somebody, get ready for a shocking discovery. All right, all right, all right. Put verse 3 back up on the, on the, on the uh, screen there. Uh, 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 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Here's what he says. Listen, he says, I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Here it is. Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures said, you could better translate this, Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures predicted, like 1,500 years earlier. Hmm. Now, two things about this. Last week I told you, remember Paul is now trying to help people to figure out the, the most, hear what he says, what was most what? Most important, the first order of importance is what he's talking about. And so last week I told you, uh, as if we're going to start afresh, the first thing we've got to kind of figure out what we're going to do is, is we've got to figure out who is Jesus. Everybody shout, who's Jesus? We, gotta, we have to answer that question, particularly if we're going to be followers. Now, the reason why I think that's an important question that we want to answer, you've seen, seen this before, I'm going to do it again. Uh, I'm going to draw. I haven't drawn in a while, and so I know you're excited about it. You just <laughs> couldn't wait. You was wondering when that was going to show up again in a message. So here we are. We're going to draw here. All right. I bet you can't figure out what this is. All right. What is that? That means I'm pretty good this morning. All right. <laughs> All right. So you got to figure out who Jesus is, right? And if you are a follower of Jesus... Uh, the question that uh, we have to grapple with is, how do I know that I'm actually growing in my faith? How do I know I'm growing? Ask the person next to you, how do you know? How do you know? How do you know? Is it just more head knowledge? I might, can, can I just learn as many scriptures as I can, and does that mean I'm growing? How might I measure whether I'm growing? I suggest that there's three things that we've got to pay attention to to figure out whether I'm growing. If I've answered the question, if I've decided I'm going to follow Jesus, whether I'm growing in my relationship. The first thing I've got to ask, ask, look at, has to do with trust. Do I trust him? And one of the questions you can ask is, you know, maybe I started off trusting Jesus 10 years ago. Do I trust him more today than I did 10 years ago? Do I trust him more today than I did Six months ago, that's a question to determine, because you say, if I'm growing, you want to know what's growing. So, is your trust growing? Everybody shout trust. 
Secondly, is the notion of commitment. Is my commitment growing? So, on the one hand, I want to be able to trust Jesus both in life and in death, but I don't just want to trust him if I'm a follower. I actually want to start living like Jesus. I actually want to start imitating the life that Jesus lived. And so the question for me is, uh, as I live like Jesus, uh, I'm, I'm becoming more and more committed to Jesus' way of life. I can measure my commitment. There are some things that, uh, are there some things that I used to do that I no longer do because of my commitment to Jesus? Are there some things that I do that I used to, didn't do because of my commitment to Jesus? For example, maybe today you do uh, devotions, you know, maybe five-minute devotion every day. You used to didn't do that because of your commitment to Jesus you do. Now, anybody who's ever been in love, you get this. <laughs> Before you fall in love, you say, there's some things I will never do. And then after you fall in love, you find yourself doing those very things. So it is with Jesus. So is my commitment growing? And then thirdly, is my heart growing? Right? My heart. Everybody touch your heart. Say, heart. Is my heart growing? What I mean by that, I mean, is, is uh, you know, simply the question, is the, if my heart, is it, is, it, is, it, is it getting bigger? That simply means more generous. And is it, is it growing? Is it growing more sensitive? That simply means more caring, sensitive, more caring. That, that as I follow Jesus and as I begin to live like Jesus live and as I, as I deepen my commitment, uh, do, do I see a kind of Jesus heart taking over my heart? Do I give easier? If I watch people in pain, do I find myself tearing up where I used to didn't tear up before? Because I care in ways I didn't care before. So part of what we have to answer if we're going to think about uh, rebooting our faith or being serious followers of Jesus is what do we do with Jesus and the way we measure in a large extent in terms of our, our growing relationship has to do with trust. Everybody shout trust. Has to do with commitment. Shout commitment. Has to do with our heart. Shout heart. More generous. Does that make sense? If that makes sense to you, give God a hand praise. If that makes sense, give God a hand praise. Now, I want to suggest to you, it's possible, by the way, that not all three of these are growing at the same time. And that's okay. But at least one of them ought to be growing. And the growth of one ought to position you uh, for the other. So, who is Jesus? And who is Jesus to you? Are you prepared to follow him? First basic question. Second basic question today is, and what about sin? Everybody shout sin. What about sin? Remember, that verse 3 ends, uh, it, it says this, and Christ, referring to Jesus, died for our what? Sins critical part of understanding what it means to be a Christian. Now, let me talk a little bit about sin. Uh, for some of us, sin is really a heavy word. As a matter of fact, basically, in our culture, it's confined to a theological uh, uses. Uh, Pastor Andy Stanley points this out, uh, and I agree with him, that, for example, your boss will never call you into the office and say, I want to talk to you about your sin. <laughs> it's a theological use. When, hey, when I was a kid growing up, I used to go to the principal office all the time. Thank God for Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> but my principal never called me and said, Herman, let's sit down and he talk to you about your sin. Never did. So it's a theological word. 
When we think about sin in relationship to God and think about sin in relationship to the Bible, sin in relationship to our relationship with God. And for some of us, if not a lot of us, sin feels like a heavy word. I mean, just hearing the word sin for some causes us, uh, it, the word itself, it, it, it oozes with the feeling of condemnation. Some when we hear the word sin, we immediately connect with feelings inside of us of guilt. We hear the word sin. I, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and she was telling me about her husband, and she was saying that he doesn't come to church regularly anymore. And, and I thought about him, because he used to go to church. There could be a lot of reasons why he may not go to church, but perhaps it is he, he reminds us of that person for whom he came to church and he heard this notion of sin. And all he could hear with that was condemnation and guilt. And it sounded like the end of it all. Because he knew about himself, like we basically know about ourselves. And, 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 and it just feels like maybe we're just trapped. And there's no hope. There's certainly no good news. So we don't really like to hear the word sin. Matter of fact, a lot of churches don't use the word sin anymore. As a matter of fact, here's the word that we basically use uh, oftentimes is the word mistakes. Everybody shout mistakes. I use the word mistakes because I realize that a lot of people, we're trying to reach folk, feel far from God, and they have these guilt reactions to certain words. And so I've used the word mistakes often. But today I want to kind of just pull that apart a little bit because uh, actually the verse, uh, Paul does not say Jesus died for our mistakes, as the Scripture predicted says, Jesus died for our what? Sins. Sins. And I want to suggest that if we, can, if we can wrestle with this word, there's some shockingly good news that's attached to this word, at least as it relates to Jesus. So let's just work it through. Now let me just talk about this notion of, of mistake just for a moment. Yesterday I went to get uh, a shave to my barber. And when I got to the barber, uh, and I sit in the chair, I noticed the TV was on, which is always the case in the barbershop. And <laughs> there was something unique about this show that I was watching, and, and it caught my attention. I asked the guy, I said, what is this show on? He says, oh, it's, it's uh, I think he called it uh, The Cheaters, or Cheaters. Any of y'all know that show? You know the show? <laughs> what is it called, Cheaters? Yeah, yeah, Cheaters. Yeah, 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 yeah. But basically, the plot is the same. And he was saying to me, I love this show. <laughs> I said, like, you know, he was getting excited. You know, he's shaving me. I didn't want to get too excited. You know, he's just, but he was getting excited. But I love this show. And, 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 and he kind of described what usually happened. It basically unfolded exactly the way that he talked about it. <laughs> this woman is in the car with the people, you know, who's figured out where her husband is. And so they got these people with walkie-talkies all over the place. And they got him. And he's coming out of, I don't know, the Hilton somewhere with the, with, with the lover. And, and they time it, man. They time it. She pulled right up. She gets out of the car. He's coming out of the hill. And he said, she said, what are you doing? Who are you with? And, you know, the barber, everybody's cracking up. Blah, 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 blah. And, and the guy, this is basically a scenario that repeats itself. But the, the guy kind of throws his hands up and says, oh, baby, I'm sorry. It was a. <laughs> now, let me just ask you. I mean, isn't there something inside of you, like somewhere that says, like, maybe mistake doesn't actually. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying. All right, oh, okay, okay, let's talk. Here, here's my definition of mistake, all right? I think mistakes have basically two components. One is, it's an accident. It's an accident. Let me give you an example. <laughs> if you're working a math problem, and it has 15 steps. And you work down, and you actually know the steps. And you're working down, and you forget step 14, because you're moving so quickly. 
That is a If, as is the case with me often, you're driving down the expressway and you actually see the exit that you're supposed to take, but you're on your Bluetooth talking to somebody and you get carried away in the conversation and the next thing you know, you're two exits past where you're supposed to get off. Come on now. That was a... It's an accident, guys, right? <laughs> Or, here's another characteristic for mistakes, insufficient knowledge. Here's a great, here's, here's a great example. Some of you have heard this story before. It's true. When I, when I was growing up as a teenager, I used to do what we call hall puck with, basically a logger. And what that really meant was that we'd go out in the woods and we'd cut down all the trees. In Louisiana, heat, about 100 degrees, we cut down all the trees. Somebody say, have mercy. <laughs> limb them up and all that kind of stuff. And so when you got ready to eat lunch, when I got ready to eat lunch, I, I'd have to, there was no shade because I cut it all down. So I crawled under the, the puckwood truck to eat my little sandwich and my little honey bun, and my little soda. And one day I crawled on, this is why I went to college, by the way, this particular incident right here. <laughs> I, I crawled under the, tr the truck. I'm eating my little sandwich, my little honey bun. Suddenly, I realized there are ants all over the place. I crawl into an ant bed. Oh, you would have thought I was shouting. I was filled with the Holy Ghost or something. I don't know, but I, I had to get out of there. Now, <laughs> that was a, yeah. See, had I known there was ants under the tree, under the trunk, would I got none of that? No. But, but it seems to me that if you're coming out of the Hilton <laughs> and it's not your wife, I mean, like, didn't you have to plan to go to the Hilton? How do you plan a mistake? <laughs> mistake just doesn't quite Well, let's say, well, it was a mistaken judgment. That's how a lot of us say, right? So that's what, come on, PH, you're just being just ridiculous. He had a mistaken judgment. Everybody shout judgment. All right, let me ask you a question. What do you call the person who makes the same mistake over and over and over and over and over? Money is your financial security is blown up because you're making the same mistake over, over, over. Lost your job because you make the same mistake over, over. What do you call that person? Okay, maybe you call that person, here it is, listen, a mistaker. <laughs> Turn to the person next to you, say, you cute mistaker. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess God is looking down on us now. He's just looking at, he says, look at all those mistakers. <laughs> but that's not what Paul calls it. Paul, in Romans chapter uh, 7, one of my favorite passages, I think it's, I think it's verse 19. Yeah, it goes up there. This is what he says. I want to do what is good. I mean, just tell me, do you relate to this? I relate to this. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do. <laughs> what do you call that? <laughs> Baby, I'm not a mistaker. I'm a sinner. Because if you read the next verse, he tells you the next verse, it's the sin nature that's in me, right? It's the sin nature that's in me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. From, 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 from Jesus' perspective, this is a great place for you and I to start. It's an, an, an admission that I am a sinner. Everybody shout, why? 
Okay, I'm going to answer that in just a minute. Listen. When Jesus dealt with sin, he basically made three points about sin. When you study him in the scripture, read him in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just read it. First point he makes about sin is essentially that everybody is a sinner. I, Jesus doesn't let anybody off the, off the hook. For example, you go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, for example. Uh, Jesus is talking to a whole crowd of people around him. They're trying to figure out who's sinners, who's not sinners. And he essentially says, look, and they got some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting around there. They never think they're sinners, right? And so he says, now look, unless your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees, man, you're going to miss it. He says, here's the deal. Uh, you've heard it written, uh, thou shall not murder, Right? Right? Uh, don't murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Then, the next thing he says is, and so people are kind of thinking, it's like, oh, I haven't killed nobody. And tell the person next to you, whoop, I'm good. Tell them something, I'm good. <laughs> I'm real good. I have killed nobody. And then he says, but I tell you, Jesus says, I tell you, watch him raising it up, stacking it up. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to to judgment. Say, wait a minute, angry. Come on, Jesus. He essentially says, look, murder is the byproduct of anger. And so if any of us have ever, you know, just got miffed at somebody and you just kind of like wanted to just wipe them off the face of the earth, just, you know, you didn't do it. You didn't do it. You know, you just kind of wanted to tear into them with your words and just tear them apart. You just kind of wanted to get them. And people's like, well, maybe that, that could be me. It doesn't let anybody off the hook. Actually, it's all of us. Then verse 27, watch. He goes, you heard it said before, that thou shalt not commit adultery. Come on, tell the person next to you, okay, I'm good. Tell them I'm good. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know all y'all. I don't know all your business. All right. It's, it's a baby. <laughs> watch this. But I tell you, my child, he tells us. Yeah, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman or vice versa at somebody who's not your spouse lustfully has already committed adultery. Oh, really? You mean I can't watch the Cinefold and Jet magazine? You know, just back when I was a kid, that was a big deal. Just, just. <laughs> Some of y'all may not know what that is, but... <laughs> With Jesus, everybody's a sinner. The preacher's a sinner. The priest is a sinner. Jesus is never surprised when preachers mess up. Because preachers are sinners. Priests, sinners. Some of us left the church and we have huge problems with, uh, with church because we feel like, you know, the preacher, you know, he said, I'm a sinner. But he said he wasn't a sinner. And I've discovered he is a sinner. But that's not good theology. If the preacher said that, that's just not good theology. Because Jesus says we all Sinner. Scripture says we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We all have the sin nature. Right? Tell the person next to you, he is talking about me. I don't like it, but he's talking about me. Tell him. Tell the other person, but he's talking about himself too. I, I feel pretty good about that. Tell him. <laughs> all right. Okay. So, so the first thing is Jesus... Uh, says we're all sinners. Second thing is, Jesus declares that he loves sinners. He loves them. In Mark chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, Jesus was hanging out at Matthew's house, eating with all the tax collectors and sinners, and people were gathered around him, and the Pharisees sat at Jesus watching him. They were so upset with him, and, and, and they were like, man, what you doing? Why, why is he hanging out? He says, but when the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees saw him eating with tax collectors and other, what? What's this word? Sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? Next verse, watch this, next verse. When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are what? Sinners. sinners. He loves sinners. He loves you. He loves me so much so that 
Paul reminds us he loves us so that Jesus died for our what? Sins. Now what does that mean? I'll tell you what that means. I get to draw again. In uh, Romans 1, it says, Now therefore, there is no condemnation. It is. So now there is no condemnation, shall condemnation, for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Here's the deal. When Paul writes these words, Jesus died for our sins as relates to us. What Paul is saying, that Jesus' death for our sins is not about condemnation. It is about reconciliation. That most times when Jesus talks about sin, he's not condemning, but rather he's trying to get us positioned so that we can have reconciliation. It's about relationship. And so, here's, what, here's, how, here's a quick way of understanding what it means he died for our sins. Here's the deal. I'm going to draw a picture of me. Do I have a beer? Oh, I forgot. All right. <laughs> All right. Who's that? PH. Thank you. All right. And before the sense of death, if I've got a sin nature, do I have a sin nature? Yes. If I have a sin nature, then it means that, that, that always there's a cloud over me, and that cloud is called condemnation. How do you spell it? Now, wherever I go, I've got this condemnation because, you know, I keep messing up. I don't want to mess up. I try, try to fix it. I'm trying to mix it. I read all the self-help books I can find out, but I keep messing up. And, and then I'm growing a little bit, but I still keep messing. I keep messing up. And so, and so, and so, and so when we, when we, when we go to sin nature, we have this condemnation that is following us everywhere. That's why some of us don't want to go to church because we go to church. They're going to remind us of the condemnation. But what Paul is saying is that when Jesus died for your sins and my sins, that if we accept what he did, that what he's done is he has, he has paid the price. Come on now, he's, he's handled, he's absorbed the penalty. And so he has removed the condemnation. I wish I had a bigger pen. But y'all see what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to scratch that out. And, 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 and so no longer is there a condemnation that's tracking me, but rather over my head is grace. And so I no longer have to be afraid to own the fact that I'm a sinner. If I own the fact that I'm a sinner, that is a beginning point. Come on now. For a reconciliation to happen in the relationship. I don't have to, do, I don't have to be afraid of punishment or, 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 or death or fear. I'm not trying to become better because I'm afraid, because I'm afraid, because I'm afraid. I want to become better because God has loved me so. The, the, the basic word for sin in the Hebrew is to miss the mark. That, that what, what he's saying, that in the death of Jesus, he's removed this notion of condemnation. He's taken that. And so now, I just want to become better because I don't want to miss the mark of God's best for my life. Can somebody say amen? amen. All right. Now, let me end it by illustrating with this story. Are y'all tracking with me so far? All right. Let me end it by tracking. One of my favorite stories to talk about this is the, is the so-called prodigal son. Let's go to Luke 15, verse 1 and 2. Let's put verse 1 and 2 up there. Watch this. I love this. Watch this. This is why. Let's keep coming back to Jesus. Keep, tell somebody, keep your eye on Jesus. All right, watch, watch, watch. Watch Jesus, not the preacher. Watch Jesus. 
Watch Jesus. Watch Jesus. Not the deacon that messed over you. Watch Jesus. Watch Jesus. Watch Jesus. What's unique about this? Tax collectors, which was the worst kind of sinners in that day, because they were Jewish people who have turned on their own people collecting for the Roman government at a huge surplus for themselves. And other notorious, that means the worst of the worst, what? Sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Isn't that kind of shocking? I mean, mean, if you are a notorious sinner and a tax collector, and if Jesus was about condemning you, would you like want to go like listen to it's kind of what's shocking about this is, that, is that, that, that folk like this always found it easy to gather around Jesus, easier than to gather around the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, read the next verse, read, put the next verse up, watch this. This made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful, shout sinful, people, even eating with them. And so here's the deal. They were like, these folk, they wouldn't go listen to the Pharisees and the teachers because the Pharisees and the teachers basically presented themselves as above sin. We don't sin, really. And everybody who came to them was locked in sin. Y'all just sinners. You're just condemned. You just go go to hell. So the, 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 the folk, the notorious sinners said, I don't need to go there. That ain't helping me at all. If I'm going to go to hell, that's all right. I get it. Let's eat, drink, be merry. At least there'll be somebody there when I get there I know. <laughs> but, but Jesus, they gather around Jesus because, not that he's, 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 he's milking, he's, he's, he's watering down anything, but just when they finished talking with Jesus, he just left with them the impression that they were loved and that they were lovable and that they were valuable and that they mattered to God. All right, so go to verse, so there's a story. So next verse says he tells a story, he, 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 to respond to that, he starts to tell a story. He actually tells three stories. He creates these stories, these are parables, he creates them. And he, he creates these parables, he constructs them to make a significant point. The first story, we don't have time to look at, is about uh, a guy who has a hundred sheep, loses one, goes to look for it. He's trying to say something about the heart of God. The second parable is about a woman who has, loses a corn. She does everything to find that one coin. He's trying to say something about the heart of God. Third one, the story is where we pick up. He says, there was a father who had two sons. About verse 11. He says, one of the boys came to the dad and said, look, dad, the law says that I'm supposed to get my part of your estate when you die. But you're living too long. I can't wait anymore. Like, since you're not going to die, can you just go ahead and give me my part of my estate so I can get out of here? So the text says, the father divides his wealth between the two boys. The younger boy takes what's divided, turns it into cash, goes to a far distant land. And the text says that he spends it all on wild living. King James Version, riotous living. Greek word for that, prodigal. That's where we get prodigal son. And then the text says, at about the time, and, and to riotous living means he got to live exactly like he wanted to, beyond limits, beyond boundaries, beyond restraints. Did everything he felt old enough, big enough, bad enough to do that his money could buy. Then, when his money ran out, about the same time, famine hit, big famine. Fellow woke up, no friends, starving. Went to a local farmer, persuaded him to hire him. The farmer sent him out into, to take care of his hogs. I used to take care of hogs. I, I know about hog taking care. I'm from the country. You, to, put, to take care of hogs, you got to put on what we call galoshes. Because when you get in a hog pen, a hog pen has got all that mud in it to keep it wet and wet because the hogs like to wallow in the mud. And then you take what they call slop. Everybody shout slop. 
So it's made up of all the food that you kind of throw away and you take some corn cobs and you mix it in with some water and so there's, a kind of, there's a kind of a formula that is used and it's really slouchy and sloppy and smelly and stinky. And the hog is going honk, honk, honk. I mean, he's just, he's just really, you're, you're like, he, he, he's loving it and you, you, you pour it into this big trough and everything splashes up on you and you, you end up being smelly and dirty. And this was where this young man was and, 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 and he looked in the trough, the text says, and he was so hungry that he started to, to eat with what the hogs were eating. Now he's Jewish, so the Jewish listeners are really kind of tripping out. This is the worst thing that happened. Then, finally, verse 17, put verse 17 up. It says, I love this, watch this. It says, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. Here I am dying of hunger. Next verse, watch this. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned. What is this? What is he going to say? I sinned. I've sinned against both heaven and you. There's God in you. Next verse, come on. And I'm no longer, his condemnation here, I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Jesus is telling the story, and he's got these notorious sinners around listening. And as he's telling the story, they are relating to what he's saying. They see themselves in the story. And, and, and as he says this, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. In other words, what I have done is so horrible that I have, I, in a sense, conceded my right to be a child of yours. Please, shout please, take me on as a hired servant. Next verse, watch this. So he returns home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, shout long way off, his father saw him, which means his father was looking for him, was hoping for him, was waiting for him. Come on now. And, and, and the father saw him coming filled with love and compassion. Suddenly these notorious sinners are realizing, wow, I'm the boy in the hall pen. The father, that's God. And he's actually filled with love and compassion for me. And watch the father. He ran to his son. All that mud and all that dirt and all that fog, all that stinkiness. He embraced him and kissed him. Come on now. Come on. And his son said to him, father, I have what? sin against both heaven and you and no longer worthy to be called a son and the father ignores what he says because the fact that the boy said I have sinned that means we can talk now come on now that means I'm owning my stuff I'm not saying it's my mama's fault I'm not saying it's my daddy's fault I'm not saying it's my economic conditions no baby I messed up I'm wrong it's my fault and the father said that's all I wanted come on now and if you read the text not one time the, the boy loses the status. Jesus is telling the story, and he always refers to the boy as the father's son. The relationship's holds intact, but what sin does, unconfessed, when we won't be fat, honest about our stuff, it messes up the fellowship. And you get that, right? When your kids, you're trying to correct your kid, they say, I'm sorry. And they won't own it. That mess up the fellowship. Get out of my face. Go in your room. Stay in there until you can get it together, right? When your spouse says, I'm sorry, won't own it, it messes up the fellowship, right? So y'all still in the same house, you're still mad, but I don't want to see you right now. But when we own it, shout own it. I'm a sinner. It opens up the floodgates of grace. This is what's the shocking good news. I'm a sinner is a starting place, not an ending place comes the ring, comes the kiss, comes the close, comes the rest of it. Here's, what's, here's where I end. Notice what's not there. There's not a long explanation. It's not in the text. I'm a sinner that captures it all. There's no repayment plan for the money you wasted. There's no probation. Let me put you on probation. None of that. At the end of the day, why? Because there's no con. Them. Notice what's there. 
There's repentance. In other words, the boy just turns around. He stops doing what he does, and he turns and he runs towards the Father. That's repentance. There's confession. I am a sinner. Come on. And the only thing that comes out of that is is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Shout forgiveness. Come on, say it loud. Forgiveness. And reconciliation. Thank God that Jesus died for my sins. Give God a hand, praise.